next year's election and there's lots of things happening on the campaign trail you need the info so that you can vote wisely in february and speaking of february here's today's big hard fact it's exactly 67 days until the general elections on february 25th 2023 and one week after that we'll have governorship and state assembly elections in most states of the federation including river state and if last thursday's appeal court ruling is the last word the rivers apc will have candidates on those ballots including my guest today he's the river state uh, apc governorship candidate tony cole welcome back to hard facts Thank you, Sandra. Always good to be here. Hmm. Lagos, you can join the conversation by calling us on 700 993 993 We're streaming this conversation live on Facebook. Facebook is Nigeria Info 99.3. YouTube, Nigeria Info FM. Um, what questions do you have for Tonya Cole? Go ahead and call and ask them. Uh, I mean, he's trying to be your governor if you're from River State. Um, what are his plans? plans for reverse people if you have those questions go ahead and call or send us a whatsapp message 080-959-75805 Tonya uh, first of all congratulations are in order um, the appeal court threw out the high court ruling stopping you from being on the ballot what were the grounds for the new ruling um, so essentially it went back to status quo take a look at exactly what the situation is First and foremost, you have an internal mechanism for which you are meant to resolve things. Mm. Uh, that was never exhausted uh, before going to court. Mm. And so that was thrown out in the first instance. Uh, the second aspect of it was that they ca the, those who participate, well, those who went to court never participated in the primaries mm. and all of that. So again, that was thrown out. Mm. Uh, there were five different things that we put through and the appeal court looked at all five of them and agreed with us that all five of them were tenable mm -hmm. and... Uh, we're back on the ballot. Back on the ballot. Do you anticipate that the pla uh, the plaintiffs will go to the Supreme Court? Mm -hmm. Can they, they go can. to the Supreme they Court? They can. They can. And it's best in politics. I think the last time I told you, everything ends up in the Supreme Court. So prepare your mind for that. Mm. Uh, but the beauty about um, the appeal court is that once the appeal court has gone your way, then you're 70% of the way. Uh, because they are very, very particular about the type of judgment they bring. And so with that in mind, I can... Uh, I can say with a lot of confidence that the Supreme Court will go away. If it does get to the Supreme Court. If it does get there. Lagos, let's hear from you. What questions do you have for Tonya Cole about his quest to occupy uh, Brick House and his plans for Rivers people? Women call us on 01465-7190. Men call us on 0700-993-993-993. Now, before we dive into your plans, I want to talk about something that affected many people in river state um the flood can you tell lagos um the extent um which the flood has impacted the people of river state it, it was very bad and uh, first and foremost this is perennial which means that every single year people can never get out of a cycle of poverty and so you we must as a government begin to think beyond just the palliative that come every single year mm. so this year's floods were particularly bad. Uh, once in a while, you get that kind of thing, mm. and it was particularly bad. Mm -hmm. I went there, I visited, but we came up with it. It's something that I'd seen a couple of years ago, and I determined that there are solutions to this. Okay. There are solutions. You don't have to wait for the floods to just give palliatives. There are solutions. You can do diking, you can do channelization. Uh, there are areas where you can uh, uh, create an embankment to channel the water in a particular particular way. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we did, mm -hmm. and we're going to implement when we get in, mm -hmm. is the channelization, embankment, and diking of the channels where the floods come through. So that you can move water away from these plains mm -hmm. where people wake up every day going to farm and make their daily living. It's, it's terrible. It was really bad. Mm. All right. We've got people trying to call in and talk to you. 99.3, hello. Yeah, good, good evening. Good, good evening. Good evening. Good um, evening. What's your name, sir? Yeah. Um, my name is Donald. I'm okay. calling in from the Kedja Lagos. Good to have you on the show. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I am an unapologetic progressive, and um, I've always implored my friends, implored everyone who I've come across, to always vote for the APC across all states. Mm. 
I am in tune, I am in tandem, I am really happy with the growth and trajectory of the Boise administration um, and under the stewardship of um, the Honorable Minister, the, 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 the past um, Minister of Transportation, who has done excellently well. Mm. Um, for the first time in my lifetime, I am seeing a Lagos but on rail line. And I tried it for myself, and I can tell, I can say that that place is very functional. Um, same with the Abuja to Kaduna, Abuja to Kano, uh, Wari to Isako rail line. Across the length and breadth of this country, I will not speak of the Lagos to Badon Expressway, the Enugu to Portacourt. We will not talk of the just um, opened um, Second Niger Bridge. I am seeing several works going on under this administration. I can tell for a fact that the APC that administration is a party to vote for, including my the honourable member there, um, Mr. Tony Cole of um, River State. I would implore all well-meaning <laughs> rivers, indigents, to please give this one a chance who has contributed no benefit to the oil and gas sector of Nigeria. He has also helped in cushioning and providing jobs to Nigerians. Eminent Nigerians, qualified Nigerians. All right, thank you very much for calling. 99.3, hello. Yeah, uh, Sandra, uh, Sandra, good evening. Good evening. Can you turn that radio off for me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Sandra, you see, uh, I don't really know how to put this, but I just want to mind my words. Okay. Yes, the last speaker said we should vote for APC because uh, they have done well infrastructurally with the um commissioning of uh, the third i mean uh, second niger bridge and uh, the battle or uh, whatever mm -hmm. are you telling me that apc has spent eight years almost eight years building second niger bridge and uh, uh Ibadan express and whatever do you know the level of suffering in this country if it were to be a, a sane society apc will not win any counselor uh, a counselorship has a slot in this country. They have done damages. A lot of damages have been done to this country, which I don't know when will come back. All right. Thank you very much for calling. Now, of course, the person I have in the studio is running to be governor, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not president of the country. But I wonder if you have thoughts on some of the sentiments that you've uh, uh, yes, just I, heard. I actually do. And it's a beautiful thing about politics. It's, uh, it's very passionate. People really wear their, they, they wear their hearts on their sleeve. Um, but when, when I hear this, I remember eight years ago, the venom in which people went with against Jonathan Goodluck and PDP. And today I hear the same sentiments in APC. So this should tell people something, first of all, um, that if you felt exactly the same way about PDP eight years ago, and now you're seeing exactly the same thing, just shifting APC to PDP, exactly the same, then it must tell us that we have to look a bit deeper and make more conscious uh, decisions beyond just anything but good luck, which was the argument then, and today is anything but APC. We, we need to ask a bit more. And this goes to then questioning the character of the people they are voting for, mm. what they have brought onto the table, what have they done in the past, why are they coming into politics. It goes beyond APC and PDP. If all you are looking at is that I must vote APC or vote PDP, I think you are getting it wrong. If all you are looking at is I must vote Christian or Muslim, I must vote North or South, then we have gone totally wrong. Mm. After 22 years or 24 years now that we are in, of this government, this new dispensation of politics, our question must be different. Our political questions have to be different. And we're not, I'm not sure we're yet asking the right questions. Mm. We need to start asking the right questions. What do you think the right question should be? So first and foremost, the people who are coming, where are they coming from? What's their background? It's a character issue. If you have people who you are questioning their character, you are questioning their school fees, schools, you are questioning their background, you are questioning who they come from, where they come from, who they are, and all that, then you have an issue, first of all, if you are starting with that. Then next, you move to, you are questioning, who, where did this person show up from? How did they get into politics? Then you, those, you know, they are serious questions. So we need to ask that. What have we done before? What background do you have? What can you show that you have? How much of a care for people do you have? These are political questions. Why have you come into politics in the first place?
this. Are you there to make money or are you there to provide solutions? Now, this is a question I asked you the last time you were here because, uh, like I said, the last time you were here, you're a successful businessman. Why are you playing in the waters of politics now? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I explained then, which anyone who has ever done business in Nigeria will know, politics affects everything we do. You know, we went, we, we went into business with the belief back then that let's take destiny into our hands. Politics is dirty. We don't need to get in there. Let's move away and just focus on business. And guess what? We built tremendous businesses. Every bank that you see today that is standing out there, the product of that, let us go and do business. Mm. Insurance companies, product of that. Oil and gas companies, product of that. Telecom companies, product of that. Whatever. The business sector in Nigeria is a product of people getting up and saying that, you know what? Politics is dirty. Let us go and but ask every successful businessman, ask anyone, call Aliko Dangote, call Herbert Wigwe, call anyone into the studio and ask them how much has politics affected their business. And you will see it's been tremendous. Mm. Now, you can no longer ignore it. And so for us to ensure that we have a country that understands what it means to create the opportunities that allows normal people to be talented people to express their talent without having to know who is in government. That's why we're there. We must change the dynamics of politics and we must change it positively. Why do you think people are not asking the right questions? Um, because they're... First of all, we're a young democracy. Okay, We're very, very young as a democracy. And so we're learning as we move along the way. And where you have hunger and you have poverty at the scale that we have it, then what people are interested in right now is just how can they feed how can they just get up and survive today? If that's what you're worried about, then the questions as to what is this person going to bring over a long term, 20 years, 15 years, what policies are they going to bring will be secondary to you. What is important right now is can this man give me food to eat? So a bag of rice will solve that problem. And so they will vote for that bag of rice. They will vote for the 5,000 naira, for the 10,000 naira. But the good thing is that there are people like you and I, there is a smaller group of people who are not hungry who should be asking the question. I'm probing that question. That's our responsibility, to probe the question, to probe those who have come out into politics and probe them hard, probe them hard. And so we must do that because when we have the opportunity to probe, to question, to sit down at panels, to answer questions, then those people who might just be hungry today might sit down and think and say, hey, but not true. This question that they just asked, why can he not answer it? Okay. If you just tuned in, Lagos, you're listening to Tonya Cole. Uh, Tonya Cole is the River State APC governorship candidate. Last time he was here, he talked to us about some of his plans. Today, he's here to remind you that he's back on the ballot as a result of um, his appeal court victory, uh, putting all the APC candidates back on the ballot in River State. So if you are from River State and you're, well, interested in who's going to be your next governor, Tonya Cole is here um, to take on all of your questions and try as much as possible possible to answer them you know uh, before we went to the phone lines we talked a bit about the flooding and i want to come back to that um the flooding river state exposed gaps in state government plans for rapid response for instance i know that um, you talked about the fact that this is perennial this is going to happen anyway so we have to have um you know all these measures in place to prevent people from getting displaced or you know being terribly affected uh by the flood um but w i also want us to talk about um the plans for the, the some of the gaps that currently exist for rapid response evacuation um flood mitigation um care for the displaced persons because i want to assume that a lot of the preventive uh, measures you talked about will not uh happen in the course of a year may not uh, be completed in before the next flooding happens so what would you do differently as governor to improve government's capacity to handle this that's a great question sandra so the first aspect of it when you think about why do we lack all of this what's the fundamental reason why there is a lack of response you can put your finger down to a lack of care a lack where we tend to see a government that does not care about people and does not care about the suffering of people. And so you need to put people first and put them inside the frame of whatever you're going to do. When you do that, then it becomes easy for you to begin to think about how 
can I prevent further suffering of someone? If you know a flood is going to come and the person's farmland is within an area where they're going to flood, and you know that when that flood comes, what they will lose is their crop first of all. So mm. their sense of livelihood is gone right off first. Then the first thing you need to do is pr begin to provide either cash that would help them go back or you provide a store for grains and food that they can. So you must provide that. So that conditional cash that is for rapid response, for just keeping people from falling into poverty is something you must begin to build. Mm. So that's something we will do. Silos. Food. How do I take your crop? Collect it now because I know that there is a flood that is going to come. You are going to lose your sense of livelihood. So pack it. When you are going to feed, how are you going to feed? Not just eat for that day, but are you going to be able to replant? They're going back. Now the flood has receded. People have gone back into the farm. How are they farming? Where are they getting the seed that they're going to need to go back into farm? Government's not providing that. And these are things that we must think about. If you don't have the people at the center of your thought, then you have a problem. Hmm. Um, you're going to have diseases that will come. Mosquitoes, malaria, all of those things that are going to come as a result of the flood water and all. Who is dealing with that? Hmm. So... These are long, uh, you've talked about the longer term, I talked about the longer term issues, Solution. solutions, mm -hmm. but there are immediate solutions which you've pointed out. And those immediate solutions can be dealt with with immediate short term measures. Mm. And we know what to do. Okay, we know what to do. Uh, speaking of knowing what to do, uh, I want to talk about um, Executive Orders 21 and 22. The great orders. <laughs> <laughs> Signed by um, <laughs> Governor Wike a couple of months ago. Um, Lagos, um, Executive Order 21 bans campaign rallies in public schools in River State and it requires government approval for any public rally with a non-refundable payment of 5 million naira. And Executive Order 22 bans the opening of campaign offices in residential areas. Your, your, your party opposed both orders and actually sued the state government. Um, but today your party has withdrawn the suit for what it calls strategic reasons. What are those reasons? I'll leave, uh, <laughs> I'll leave the reasons of why it's been withdrawn out of the picture. Okay. But let me go to the... Um, uh, what's it? You know, there's a meanness to certain things when you deny people their voice. And what that leads to often, and this is what we've been struggling with, is the violence that comes with restraining people and just putting them in a place where they know that injustice is being done. Executive Order 21 and 22 are unjust in every way. The first aspect of it is that you're a sitting governor. I must come to you as an opposition to get permission from you to come out and campaign against you. Or Naturally, we're not going to get the result of that. So the first aspect of it was how do we silence, so for the Executive Order 21, how do we silence the voice of the opposition in the state so that the people will not hear what they have to bring onto the table? It, it brought out a lot of bitterness in people and we literally had to stop people from going violent on it. Just saying, you know what, let's not fall into that trap that River State is always seen as a violent state. Just let's bear it. God knows we'll get out of this one. Then you bring Executive Order 22, which I'm an architect. For the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, there has been no demarcation as to where it's residential, where it's commercial. In Nigeria, it's a problem. Everywhere has become commercial. Then you now say, you have offices in your own campaign office on the same street that I have my campaign office. And then you get up and say that we cannot have campaign offices in residential areas. You know, it just smacks of wickedness. <laughs> <laughs> what's your What's your personal view of of those two orders? Uh, do you believe they're illegal? Uh, and if you believe they're yeah. illegal, why aren't you, Why aren't you guys the APC that is challenging it in okay. court? So, so and this is where you draw a fine line. A governor has a right to give an uh, to give an executive order. So you can't call it an illegal order, right. but it's an unjust order. Okay, so the fact that you, I have the right to do so, but I'm doing it trampling on the rights of people, you know, it's just uh, the injustice, the insolence, the, the impunity of it is just a smacks of wickedness. Yeah. But beyond that, what it told me 
as a person, politician going into business, was that the opposition was afraid. And I kept asking, what are they afraid of? Why are you afraid? If it's an open contest, come out. You have a candidate. Okay, yeah, he's wanted by the EFCC. He's in hiding and all of that. But if he's good enough, then he should come out. Let's stand up and let's just debate. You have an idea, I have an idea. Maybe your idea is better than mine. People will vote for you. If my idea is better than yours, then they will vote for me. If they prefer me to you, then so be it. We shake hands and we move on. Four years later, you can come back and try. But why must you restrict us, put us in the corner, make sure that we are not seen because your candidate is not seen? Come on now. We don't need that. Lagos, let's talk. 0700-993-993-993. What questions do you have for Tony Cole? Tony Cole is the APC Guba candidate for River State. He wants to be governor of uh, River State after Nyesum Wiki. What questions do you have? Emphasis on questions uh, do you have about his quest to occupy um, the Brick House and his plans for River's people? Um, 0700-993-993-993. That's for men. Women, call us on 01465-7190. WhatsApp is 80 959 I've got Sobere on the line. Hi, Sobere. Good to have you on the show. Hello, Sandra. How are you? I'm very well. Where are you joining us from? I'm calling from London. So, um, I want to say, I uh, send my greetings to Dr. Tony Cole. Okay. It's very nice to hear your voice once again, um, Honorable Tony Cole. Thank you, Sobere. I wish you all the best um, in the elections come um, February, March 2023. But, the, the, you know, there is this perception by people, especially those outside of River State, that Governor Wiki has changed um, um, River State to, um, would I say, um, to Paris or Dubai with flyovers, all of these, you know. However, when I speak to my relatives back home, my sisters, brothers, they are like those are mere media because roads are still impassable. My local government area has no hospital, hospital where my sick grandmother can go and receive treatment. What, how would you deal with this media hype that um, the government of River State is using to, to, I mean, blindfold Nigerians, especially those that are not on ground? Thank okay. you. Thank you, Sobere, and thank you for keeping the question short. Thank you, Sobere. Again, a great question. And the good thing is that the election in River State is about River State, and it's for River State people who are in River State to vote, and they know the truth. If River State was only Obiakwo, only Obiakwo, where 10 of the 12 bridges, flyovers were built, where the law school is built, where everything is done inside one local government. If that was all that was voting for River State, then the next uh, uh, governor is a shoo-in. They will be very happy because all the development was there. But one out of 23 local governments, all the other local governments have suffered dearly. And the good thing is that they see it. So I've told, I've seen, you've talked about a hospital. There are many places in River State that have no presence of government. They've never seen a policeman. Policeman. They've never seen a magistrate. Not to talk of a doctor. Forget it. There are zones on their own where militia run the thing. They run all sorts of governments there. And these are places that need to see government's presence. So River State election is going to be dealt with by people who are on the ground, who will see and vote for the change that they want to see. And that's what we bring. We're bringing hope to them. So thanks, Obera, for that question. All right. We've got questions on WhatsApp. Let's take a look at some of them. Uh, Madam Sandra, can your guests please explain the difference between the executive order and River State on campaigns uh, from opposition parties in River State and the attempt of the APC-led government on trying to gag the media or trying to restrict the voice of the voiceless in Nigeria? Especially when the news are not in their favor. Is there any difference? Femi from Dallas with that message there. Uh, uh, Femi, I don't know. I don't know whether, first, I don't know about the gagging or whether there's a difference. What I know is that I'm on the radio right now speaking. I know that you're on social media and in Nigeria, the social media is not banned. I know that you can say anything you want about the president or whoever in Nigeria and nobody's going to come and 
arrest you or gag you or throw you away. So I know that we have progressed a lot. I know people might still be uncomfortable with the news, but truly, if you really think about it, there is a, there is, there is a lot of freedom in Nigeria about what you say, who you say, how you say it, and where you say it. We, we, we have a lot of freedom. Well, Twitter was banned. It was, but Twitter is there. But it was banned. Yeah, but it was banned, but it's there. It came back. But it was banned. I agree. I agree it was banned. But I can't... What was it, what was it banned about? Do you remember? Uh, well, the ban was because the president's tweet was deleted. Okay, so they banned it because the president's tweet was deleted. They yes. didn't ban it because Nigerians said something about the president. Well, no. Okay, so that's the point. And after the unbanning, Nigerians are still saying a lot about the president. Mm. So, and they are not, they've not been arrested and thrown into jail or killed and hidden. So the truth of the matter is that I said we're a young democracy, we're progressing, we're working, but I think it's a bit different. So uh, to my friend in Dallas, I'm sure you can go on to the tweet right now and say something and no one will come after you. Mm. All right, we've got a message here from Somaga. Somaga says, Tony Cole's point strikes a chord. The character of who we vote and asking the right questions is where we've missed it all these years i hope however he knows that his brilliant points about character uh past identity etc in many ways shades his own party's presidential candidate i wish him very well if i were in rivers he would have my vote okay uh somaga thank you for your message do you want to respond to somaga's message no, no? Somaga, well done. okay <laughs> We've got a message here from Patrick Nejibo. Patrick says, uh, Good a thing Mr. Cole talked about asking questions and answering them concerning gray areas for contestants, their programs, ability to carry them out. Uh, what's his thinking about his party's principles candidate uh, to show up to answer our questions? Okay. So uh, I think that's like the first question that uh, I was asked if I was going to answer. And let me, let me point out something that I believe that most Nigerians miss and we need to address moving forward. By the time you have candidates coming out, it's too late. Uh, really, it's too late. You're, at that point, you, you have a choice of withholding your vote or choosing to vote for the least worst character that you have. And by then, it's late. And so one of the, the reasons why we are in politics is so that we can educate the general public that politics starts from the, as soon as this election is over, the next round, four years, begins immediately. It begins immediately. So please become a ward party, carry, card carrying member of a party so that you can be a delegate. Because at the end of the day, think about it. Less than 3,000, less than 3,000 delegates decided who will be an APC candidate, presidential candidate for 200 million people. Less than 1,000, less than 1,000 people decided who will be the PDP candidate for 200 million people. And as for labor, less than 50 people decided or less than 100. I don't know. It was in the room. I saw the picture. So less than 100, less than 200 made a decision for who will be the presidential candidate for 200 million people for labor. So that should tell you something to Nigerians that the issue is not which is the best candidate. No, by then it's late. The issue is who are the delegates and how do they become delegates? And where were you when they were selecting them as delegates? So we need to re structure how politics is and that's why we're there hmm. um, your party's presidential candidate released um, its mani uh, his manifesto and he has a section about the digital economy where your party wants to create one million tech jobs if elected governor uh, Tony, what policies would you implement in well implement for um, plugging river state into the digital economy in general, okay. and then um, the Tinubu plan in particular. Okay. So first and foremost, the digital, digital technology and digital economy is something I believe in. When I was at NIPS at the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, my project, my individual research project, was on digital economy. I looked at that policy. Why? Because I wanted to understand what is the next big thing that can help Nigeria leapfrog into the next uh, generation and digital economy is where it is so i'm a firm believer in digital economy and it's something i believe that river state needs why because one of the alternatives that we need to bring in river state is an alternative to oil 
in our thinking. The mindset of every reverse man is an entitled mindset to oil. And it's, I'm, I'm okay with the fact that oil is in our background and it must do much more for us than it has and all the stories, derivation and all that. I have no problem with that. But I know that we can be much more. And if there's something that will do that is the digital economy, but what do you need to do that? You need infrastructure. So you need fiber optics, you need uh, 5G technology, you need all of those things. But what does it do when you put it in place? It opens up a large scope of things, opportunities that people can do, young people can do, without having to know the government. They don't ever, and this is my dream, that you do not have to know the direction to your local government chairman's house before you can eat in reverse. You don't need to know the governor or your commissioner for what? Why? Before you can set up your own business and survive. That's where we need to get to. And digital economy will take us there. Okay. Lagos, uh, let me take a few more of your thoughts. 0700993993993 0140 7190. But of course, um, before I come to you, I have to ask, do you think that there's a role for um, government when it comes to changing that oil obsessed mindset that you talked about because i grew up in river state and um i know what it's like in river state you know when it comes to the oil yes there's a big role you know nigerian government first of all um has seen the devastation today of a ukrainian war that should have become a boom to nigeria but it's not a boom it's almost a bust for us because all the oil that we are struggling to produce, struggling to... Exp- Why? Because there are more independent independent bunkers of Nigerian oil than... Yeah, yeah, it's almost at par. If Nigeria as a state exports 1 million barrels, those who are illegal exporters are doing 1 million barrels. So who, who really owns the country? So there is a, there is a clear need for us as a government to take a focus on how we deal with oil and the story around oil, especially in the Niger Delta. And I don't think it's the Nigerian government that can do it. The Nigerian government is lost when it comes to this. It requires us as Rivers people, as Niger Delta people, as the government in the Niger Delta and the people to sit down and look at what it's doing. There's an old saying, don't fight a war in your background. We're fighting a war in our background. The war is destroying our ecology. It's destroying everything about us. And this is oil. And it's destroying us. So who benefits in the long run? It's not us. So we need to sit down as a people and decide that oil is in our ground. Oil can be exploited. Oil can go out. We have no problem with all of those things. But it must not destroy us. How would you influence that as governor? Okay, so there are old women that no longer can get his arm. There are old women who cannot go out. When they go out to the creeks, what they used to bring out to feed on before, it can take what they used to bring in one day can take them a week to get it. Mm. They are feeling it. You know, there is a feeling. There is something that you can see. If 20 years ago, you had no idea that going to uh, Pickett or going to uh, bust a pipeline in Jones Creek was going to affect anybody. It was just one little well head somewhere and it wasn't going to make a difference 20 years ago. Today, you can see it everywhere. It's real. You know, people don't understand the emotion of the Niger Delta till you go, please take a helicopter and just go and take a look. It's real. So uh, we feel it. We know it. So sitting down and having this conversation is not a difficult conversation to have amongst ourselves. If somebody comes from the outside to have that conversation, you are resentful. You are resentful. You feel that they are accusing you. But it is you. a conversation that has been had over and over and By over. Who? By successive, um, I want to say, administrations with stakeholders in River State. Uh, are you saying it's never been had no. uh, by a former governor of River State or the people of River State? No, because I haven't seen... Uh, so let me not say a categorical no. Okay. But I think that there are two things that you have to do. The first aspect of it is we are telling people that this is what we are seeing as a problem. Mm. What's the solution? If you don't offer people something and alternative... What's your solution? So that's where I go into the digital economy. That's where I go with creating something else that they know their talent can come alive with. If I can sit down, which I know you know very well, if I can sit down in River State and I'm earning foreign exchange doing work in 
Korea, Japan, New York, and have not left Sagbama, that's good enough. Then I know I do not have to go into the forest and go and get a pipeline to make one naira. If I can do that and you can show me how to do it, and guess what? It's so possible today. It's possible. We look around Lagos. I, there used to be a time, Ijibu and all of that, they used to bust pipelines here. There are massive fires in Lagos. Today, you hardly see that. You hardly see it. Why? Because people are realizing that they don't need to go into this dangerous thing of scooping ket- uh, per- petrol for them to survive. Um, I have to ask. So, so you mentioned the the war at home. You know, you talked about fighting a war um, at home. You talked about the ecological disaster. Part of the reason why I left River State um, was the suit. Exactly. Um, and there are lots of people like me who left yeah. River State because of the suit. We talk about oil fire, uh, illegal artisan, uh, artisanal uh, refining. Uh, we know the impact that it's having. But government seems unable or unwilling to bring an end to it in part because of all the vested interests and public acceptance of it. What would you do differently about fire, for instance? Okay. So, again, it comes back to the first aspect of it. There's an education that has to go with fire. You know, when you talk of black suit, people don't see the impact. You see it, but you don't see the impact to you in your health till 20 years later when your children and yourself start having respiratory issues. And it's a slow death. It's just one slow death. Which means that we must be able to educate people about this is a problem. Mm. The good thing is that we have the history now. You have 20 years, you've seen it, there is data to it, so people can see it. So there's an education that must be done. So the first aspect of it is that we're going to painstakingly educate people as to the dangers of what they're seeing. But you're educating somebody who is hungry. You see, we must understand that there's a poverty issue at stake. Mm. There's an unemployment issue at stake. There's an issue where people have been deliberately left out of schools. Deliberately. The education system has been collapsed in certain areas in River State. These are deliberate issues. And we must deal with that aspect of it. So, hand in hand, as you're telling somebody that this is going to cause blah, 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 and so on and so forth, the man is looking at you and saying, but this is the only way I eat today. Now, you must be able to substitute that for something. Now, in the first instance, you may substitute it for money, that's what the federal government tried to do with amnesty. But it's a short-term thing. If you start giving people money, they sit at home, they're folding their hands, and they're just expecting money. Hmm. They must be able to work. We must be able to make sure that that substitution is in something that brings labor to them, for them to be able to feed hmm. and live, live off. It's a long-term work, but it's a work that is necessary. We cannot, have, Sandra, we cannot close our eyes to this. We hmm. can't. Okay. Um, I think we just addressed that question. Bao from Ikorodu has the same question about soot and the environmental cleanup and gas flaring, etc., etc. Um, we've got uh, Max from Ikeja who says, what are your three critical areas that you would tackle immediately if you get in as governor? So that's his first question. He has a number of other questions, but let's start with that first one. <laughs> <laughs> Was that Max? Yes, Max. Max, Max mm-hmm. okay. Max, first and foremost, if you, if based on everything that I've said, you will know that one of the things that really concerns me is social welfare, which basically is how do you make sure that a man can eat today just you know just provide food today it's only when you're able to do that that you can start talking to them about tomorrow if not you're just wasting your time and i learned this the hard way on the campaign ground four years ago you must be able to answer the immediate need today that's number one that then brings hope so social welfare is one of the foundational pillars of this government the government that i want to bring the second thing which we haven't talked about today but it's there or maybe we talked about in the executive orders and all of that is the impunity that comes with law and order if you do not have security law and order forget it businesses get up and they leave river state per second per second because they do not have confidence that they can go to court they don't have confidence that their cfo will not be revoked they don't have confidence that they will build a structure that somebody uh, a governor will not come and collapse because somebody had a meeting inside the office you know there are so many things like that 
businesses need to know that there's a stability in the judiciary, peace and security. That for me is critical. As a businessman, we must do it. So social welfare, peace and security as a pillar, law and order, second pillar. But the third one, which then goes to why we talked about digital economy and all of that, is infrastructural development, not de sorry, developmental infrastructure. Not infrastructure development, but developmental infrastructure. And what's the difference? This is any kind of infrastructure that will encourage development, whether it's digital, whether it's infrastructure, fiber optics, whether it's on new cities that have to be built, which must be built. River State cannot be one city, only Port Harcourt. No way. No way. So we must build other cities. So any kind of infrastructure that will encourage development, we must be able to do it. So those for me are the three things. In the center of all of this are the people. Anything that we're doing that is not people-centered, people-focused, forget it. It's a waste of time. All right. Let's come to the phone lines now. 99.3, hello. 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 Thanks for calling. What's your name, sir? Yeah, good evening. Uh, would you permit my being anonymous? That's fine. Welcome. Well, I like your voice. I yeah. wish you were not anonymous. Good evening. Welcome. I, I, I am a veteran. Comrade. Okay. Um, Tony called. Uh, congrats for winning the... Your yeah, um, court case. Thank you. Yeah. I am moved. I don't like calling in, but I am moved to call in. Uh, you said something about the concentration of uh, development in rivers. Yes. Um, law schools, so now. It's not, I, I am not, I am not supporting any party. Yes. But I think I will want your kind of person to come to replace Wiki. But I love Wiki for one thing the fight against domination of the northerners we have to just uh, expect them to spread all the developments in river that's what is expected in nigeria yes. you don't fight uh, one lagos is by the road i'm calling from redemption camp um lagos is by the road promised two three years took eight years look at all the vital Positions in Nigeria is to the northerners. If we want this gun, same thing. I think that is what what Wike adopted, which is not proper. Now, somebody like me that have worked was a veteran with the defunct Daily Times of Nigeria. Hmm. Now, that means you know my father yeah. very well. What was your father? Patrick Dedeko. He was the MD of the. Oh Times. my God! <laughs> you should sure know fine country. I do. <laughs> The editor of a weekend yes. is late now. Yes, yes. Oh my God! Oh my! I, I, it's like that. I'm short of words. Family reunion. It's, Please continue. But right <laughs> now, right now, you see what I'm talking about. If things are distributed evenly, um, hospital here and there. Somebody like me now, I have no pension as a result of defunct uh, Daily Times. Now I am. I, I, as I'm talking to you for the past two years, to go and do my right as can, mm. I don't have that money. Mm. My wife is from your place. Mm. My mom is from River. Mm. <laughs> so there has no way. If the country is well organized, the way one is partially crippled here now wouldn't be there. Right. So when you get there, please spread the whole. Um, Amenities. Okay, All right. Thank you very much thank for you calling. Very much, sir. Okay, we've got uh, other messages here. Uh, you're so different from most candidates from your party, having followed your 20 year plan. Good luck to you. That's a message from Max. Thank you, Max. Uh, here is a message that says. Um, uh, you're complaining about Wiki's 21 orders as intimidating, but in Lagos, there are no other banners than APC. Uh, this message says, uh, I'm not from River State, I'm not APC, but Tony Cole is a man that I love so much for his intelligence and political sophistication. This is one of the men we need in the corridors of power. Unfortunately, Nigerians don't um, always want good men to be their leaders. You can imagine where they celebrate Wike as the best governor in Nigeria just for concentrating development in his village. I don't know who will deliver us from this political quandary. All right, Chimbike 
from Aja with that message there. Uh, here's a, a message from Kenny in Akuche. Kenny says, your guest did not answer the question of the presidential candidate of his party not making himself available for questioning by Nigerians. Okay. Uh, Bioye Nyaba says, I just Googled you and I see you went to KC. The state of that school is disturbing and very sad. I'm pretty sure you are a pastor. Do you preach about politics? And what would you do to curb corruption? <laughs> okay. So, yes, I'm a pastor. And what would I do to curb corruption and King's College? You know, so first and foremost, almost every institution that you have in Nigeria is a reflection of the nation that we have. And it's a reflection of the kind of leadership that we have had over the years of which corruption becomes a major issue. Now, I was part of something called Pact Against Corruption Initiative. So you Googled it. So Google that as well, please. It's called PACI, P-A-C-I, of the World Economic Forum. And as a Nigerian company, to get in there was tough because as far as we are concerned, anybody who is Nigerian, you carry the total of corruption. So business anywhere in the world is tough as a Nigerian. So we faced corruption. Now going to politics, that makes it even worse. because. But then, what, where do I bring all of the head? The mere fact is that in part, one of the things that we saw was that war against corruption anywhere in the world was a losing battle. You don't lose it if you go as a war. You win it when you go with the intelligence of designing corruption out of any system. And this is what we are going to do. So how do you design corruption out of any system? First of all, wherever there are hurdles, remove the hurdles. Wherever you have to create cash to be paid and exchanged from one place to another, remove the cash. There are little things. So customs in Chile was an example. And they made sure that they, were, they shone the light on import duties so that anybody who was importing anything knew exactly how much they were going to pay. And they put it out there in public, pasted in the newspapers everywhere so that when you are bringing in a telephone, you know that you are going to pay 10 naira for that telephone. No customs logbook and all of that. And then they made sure that you paid it into an account so that you don't have to take the 10 naira to go and see one customs officer who will tell you that you should pay 20 naira instead of 10. And guess what? Corruption, Chile customs died overnight. There are solutions to this thing. It's not rocket science. And guess what? We'll implement it. So I am a very, very strong advocate of designing corruption out of any system. Business people are the implementers of every policy, which means that a businessman knows exactly where the hurdles are. They know where the corruption points are, and they know how to design it out. That's one of the things I bring. I know how to design corruption out of a system. Lagos, if you just tuned in, you're listening to Hard Facts or 99.3 Nigeria Info. Hope to tackle them. Okay, so three things. So the first, out of 